Okay, so hopefully things are starting to show up now. We're just sorting out the last few little tech things here. Um, as you're waiting for the presentation to get started, please do write in the chat box and let me know where you're coming from, whether you're teaching today, and um, what kind of studio you have. Just a little bit about you. I'd love to know who's uh, live today. So feel free to leave your comments in the chat box. It seems to be working for me, but we'll see if... Oh, Dana or Dana says it's working, so that's wonderful. Um, there will be a slight delay between the chat and the video. So if you write something and I don't react to it right away immediately, please don't worry, I will get to it. It's just that it hasn't shown up for me. That's what's happening there. Um, so Dana sees me. Let's see who's on the call so far. Okay, so we have Sarah or Sarah. Nicola, I, I presume it's not... Um, Sarah Campbell, because she would have said. So, Sarah or Sarah, we don't know. Um, Dana or Dana, <laughs> lots of names I could pronounce multiple ways. Julie is here. Not sure where Julie's from. Um, Laura is from Couple or Couple, Texas, near Dallas. That's cool. Awesome. Dana is in rainy Oregon. Rainy most of the time here in Ireland, so I do sympathize. <laughs> um, let's see who we el else we have. Julie from Idaho. I am going to be in Idaho this summer. I'm really excited about that. She's teaching later this afternoon. Laura seems to be working for Laura. That's great. 23 wonderful students in sunny Cobble, Texas. No students on Friday, though. Oh, nice. Day off. Lovely. I'm not sure about that name, but last night, thunder and lightning during lessons. Oh my gosh. You know, a few weeks ago, I had a power outage during my lessons, which was really quite an experience. I had candles everywhere. Um, there's still a little scorch mark on the shelf above my piano now because I um, had all these candles out because I had a student who was, you know, studying really hard for an exam. I couldn't really reschedule her lesson so we had to go ahead with candlelight it was very interesting um beth is from pittsburgh pennsylvania <laughs> julie says yay for coming to idaho yeah i'm excited julie um jana only two today nice nice short day for you then concerts with my 80 voice choir wow okay cool all weekend. Uh, Dana, thank you for clarifying, Dana. <laughs> I'm never sure about these types of names. Okay, hi from Jan in Pennsylvania as well. Awesome. Kids were asking if I had candles. Yeah, well, luckily I had tons because I had some uh, stashed away from years before from our, our weddings because I did um, all my own wedding uh, centerpieces and I had all these candles, so I just put them absolutely everywhere. Um, Edmonton, Alberta, first person from outside the States, from Canada, wonderful. Let's see who else is joining in. We're nearly ready to get started. I'm really excited to share these practice tips with you. I wish I knew who that was. X-O-E-K-S. I, I don't know who that is, but she says I'm amazing. So I'm a big fan of her already, her or him. Um, <laughs> India, Indianapolis, Indiana, cool. All sides of the states represented in the chat box. That's wonderful. I do like to get started pretty much on time. It's one minute past seven now. I said I'd start at seven, but I always give it just another few minutes. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that, but the dogs in the gardens all around me have just uh run wild okay all the names were taken so i had to make up a name don't know what that's about odd thing in the chat software obviously and thank you for joining brennan from vancouver okay cool awesome and my real name is sharon okay hi sharon i think i had an email or something from you i feel like i oh yeah i just had an email from you tonight anyway um 
that's probably you anyway. Okay, awesome. I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes to make sure everyone has a chance to join, and then we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen and show you these five wonderful practice strategies. Faye is watching from Cincinnati, Idaho. 30 students. Nice. I don't know if you can hear those dogs. Just to explain that a little bit, if you can, I am in my home office, which is like a little building in my garden. So if you can hear a dog going wild or any crazy sounds like that, that's what's going on there. My office is in a garden, so I am surrounded by dogs, although they're not my own and I can't uh, put them away or anything like that. 46 students there. Oh, way more than me. Indianapolis. Chris from Georgia. Nice. Debbie from England. Oh, hi. Someone from this side of the Atlantic. Hi, Debbie. Very welcome. Okay, I'm going to set up this screen sharing now so that we can get started with the presentation. Just going to make sure whether this shows up or not. There might be some oddness happening. So I just want to make sure the tech is all working okay before I launch off. Just two seconds here. Okay. That's showing up for me now, um, and it should be fine for everyone. Based on my tests and based on the last time I did this, I think it should be okay. So ignore the menu bar at the top. Google does not like it when I go full screen. It's got a thing against that. So we're just going to stick with um, it in this view. So welcome to the presentation. I'm so excited to have so many people here. I hope you're ready to get started. Just a little introduction to me before we jump onto those practice strategies. I'm a piano teacher in Dublin, Ireland, and I recently released a book called The Piano Practice Physician's Handbook. Um, I blog at colorfulkeys.ie and my Facebook community is called the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers uh, Group on Facebook. So. Um, most of you will know me from either colorfulkeys.ie or the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers community. If you're not in that community, please do ask to join. I'd be delighted to have you in there. Um, what ties all this stuff together that I do is that I'm passionate about creative, inclusive and forward thinking piano teaching. So everything I do is all about sharing these different ideas, um, all about creative, and modern ways to teach the piano and teach music in general. In today's workshop, we're going to be going through five wonderful practice methods. So these are uh, inspired by some of the stuff from my Piano Practice Physicians Handbook that I released recently that some of you may have seen about the place. Um, and the five strategies we're going to cover today will help you with students with floppy fingertips, fingertips that bend backwards, which I'm sure you've all had students like that. Students who complain about not playing consistently well. So they are a bit inconsistent with the way they play um, and they can't seem to make it stick and be played the same way every time. We have hesitations before leaps, so students who have difficulty moving around on the keyboard and reluctance to play quickly. So students who want to play slowly all the time, very cautious about playing like that. And then missing sharps or flats. So I'm sure we all spend a lot of our day perhaps saying F sharp over and over and over. So this is a solution to help you av uh, to avoid that. Uh, phrase coming out of your mouth all day long. Now, there is a free printable download at the end, so please stay tuned for that. Um, I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation, and 
uh, it will help you to implement the cures more easily because um, it's just easier to have something to refer to, isn't it? And it's way easier for your students to practice this way when you can send this home with them in the in their practice folder or stapled to the front of their book or whatever you want to do. So stay tuned for that. That's coming at the very end. Just a couple more people in the chat there. Hi, Nicola. Celestina. Oh, yeah, I know Celestina. Um, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I do know her from emailing back and forth. And Becky from Georgia. I think that's Miss Be Becky, isn't she in Georgia? Um, <laughs> Be Becky Laurent. Anyway, Laurent, I suppose it is. I think her husband's French. Anyway, um, and someone who's just bought my book. Oh, I'm chuffed. That's wonderful. Okay. So if you do have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat box. I'll be delighted to get to them at the end. I may even answer them during the presentation, but I will definitely come back to all the questions at the end. Um, and I've saved time for that. So please put your questions into the chat and I'll be delighted to help in any way I can. Why am I so passionate about this idea of improving piano practice? Well, students spend just 1%, less than 1% of their week with you, okay? So their parents may not know anything about music. They may not have studied music themselves, even if they did study music themselves it's very unlikely that they remember exactly what it was like to practice. <laughs> and even if they do remember what it was like to practice when they were young, it's not really the same anymore. And our kids today are dealing with completely different things. Oh, Becky C from the Inner Circle. Sorry, Becky. Um, and yeah, sorry for interrupting myself. Um, so even if they do remember what it was like uh, when they were a kid, it's not really the same for kids these different these days. So um, they need to practice at home all the same and they need to practice well. So we need to find a way to teach them during our 1% of the week with them, less than 1%, what to work on during the other 99% of the week. Okay, so these strategies today, how do you use them? Well. All of these strategies need to be done in the lesson first, okay? So this isn't practice strategies as in only to be done during what we normally call practice time. These strategies should be done in the lesson and at home. The way I approach piano practice is that we use the lesson to not just demonstrate or explain, but to really go through the pro practice processes with our students so that they really know what they're doing and it'll make it easier for them to act on these at home. And unless it's really easy for them to do it at home, they're not going to do it. So always do them together in the lesson, get your student to explain the strategy back to you, and then ask them to follow through at home. You can use the printables that I'm gonna give you to ask them to follow through at home. Once you've done that, you send them home, you ask them to practice that way. Maybe they don't do it, <laughs> and maybe they do. Either way, reiterate at the next lesson, ask them to practice again, make sure they explain it back to you, and you just repeat that over and over in a big loop. Eventually, these habits will stick, they will sink in, and they'll become a natural part of what they do. They'll just become an instinctive thing for them to follow this kind of structure without even think of thinking about it. But that's not gonna happen instantly. So you need to be persistent. You need to keep repeating it at the lesson so that they experience it many times and it's easy for them to follow through. On to our first strategy. So the first one is called tallies. And I'm a big fan of this strategy. This is a, a cure for what I call, I played it better at home-itis. I played it better at home, Itis, is, <laughs> well, kind of what it sounds like. Do you ever have students who come into the lesson? You might uh, write in the chat box if you recognize this one. Students who come into the lesson and they play it and they're just so disappointed or frustrated or annoyed and they say, I played it better at home. 
Yeah, well, there's two sides to this story. One side is, yes, they did, probably, okay? Because they were less nervous at home. No one was watching them. They were in the zone. They're on their own piano, all of these things. The other side to that, Laura says, yes, <laughs> LOL, that was that. I was that kind of student. I think I don't know if I was ever that kind of student, but I have many of them. Becky says yes, absolutely yes. So you all understand this and you've experienced it. Um, these students don't feel it's a fair reflection of the work they put in at home, but the thing is, they're also remembering their practice with rose-colored glasses. They don't really see how practice works. And they're also not seeing all of their practice all together. They're just remembering the best bits. <laughs> they're remembering not their blooper reel, but uh, their best cuts. So how do we do the tallies? Well, the tallies are very simple. Ask your student to play their piece is the first step. Now, that's only for short pieces. I always advise practicing in sections if you have anything that's longer than, you know, a short method book piece. If it's a proper proper length piece, talk about a section at a time. So ask them to play the section and then ask them to give it a score out of 10. Don't give it the score yourself. Make sure they give it the score. Um, once they've given you their score out of 10, you can ask them guiding questions if you think they're just way off on what they think. Um, although that may reveal something else to you if they're giving it 10 out of 10 and they've made all sorts of mistakes. But um, yes, you can ask them guiding questions and nudge them, but make sure they come up with the final number. And you write it down on the uh, tally sheet, which I'm going to give you at the end. So you write down their first score, ask them to play it again and again and again, 10 times, and each time they're giving it a score out of 10. Once you've done all of that, add up all those scores together and divide by 10 so that you have the average score. And then have a little discussion with your student about how this average score is a more accurate reflection of what they should expect to perform like. They shouldn't expect the best score. They shouldn't expect the time they got it 10 out of 10 to just come out of their fingers the next time. That's not the way piano practice works. What they're really going to get is an average of all of those scores. So during the week, they use the tally sheet um, to average their score every day. You can have an adult help them, of course, if they're young, but you know, explain to them how the sheet works use it in the lesson, and then have them average these scores every single day. They should aim to get this average score up. So they shouldn't be aiming to get 10 out of 10 one time and then they're done, which is probably what's been happening if they have this, I played it better at home, I this. They should be aiming to get that average score up. Give them a goal. I want your average score when you come next week to be eight. Okay, eight out of 10. And that way they can expect to perform that way in the lesson. And it, if it is just nerves, then that's a different thing. But you'll probably find that once they use the tallies, it reveals something about their own mental image of how their practice works and what way they're practicing at home. And they'll make them more aware and make their practice quality better. Okay, so our next cure is the bionic pianist. <laughs> this is a cure for floppy finger predicament, which I don't even need to ask, I think. I know people have this. I know people are frustrated by it, but absolutely leave your experiences with the floppy finger predicament in the comments. This is that top finger joint which bends backwards. You'll see it in the photo right there. That's my own hand. Don't worry, I'm double jointed so I didn't hurt myself or anything. But it does not look fun and it doesn't look like it's going to produce some nice tone at the piano, does it? So these students are normally pushing from their finger instead of using their arm weight. And their fingers are bending backwards. You'll find this common 
really common in students with long slender fingers that look like they would be very good um, for playing the piano. But the thing about these fingers that um, a occupational therapist once explained to me was that the tendons are kind of stretched out and therefore um, and therefore they have less control over that top fingertip joint. So we need to get them to use their whole arm weight even more if that's the case so that they can control that top finger joint. Okay, so how do we do the bionic pianist? So the bionic pianist, we start with just pencils. So pick out a pencil with an eraser or rubber tip on it and hand it to your student. Ask them to hold it in their hand and they should use this to play their piece or a section of their piece. They can do the right hand on its own using the pencil to play and then the left hand on its own using the pencil to play and then hands together. This is really good fun. I really enjoy doing this. It's a wonderful experience um, and it produces a lot of laughs. But what it, the goal of it is that we're going to get our students to feel their whole arm moving as one unit. Okay, so they're playing with their whole arm. There's no other way to do it when you have a pencil as your playing implement. Once you're satisfied that this is working well and that your student is moving their whole arm, that's when you can switch to the second type of bionic pianist, which is the thumb bracing the finger. So the thumb is gonna sit in behind the finger. You may have seen this in, um, excuse me, in piano method books, particularly young beginner books, I find tend to do this a lot, um, such as My First Piano Adventures, those kind of books. They'll talk about this braced thumb. In My First Piano Adventures, it's called um, the donut. So they talk about a one, three donut. And, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> so they talk about a one, three donut in my first piano adventures. And this is a good way to support that top fingertip joint. You may have to help your student to form this hand shape at first. It doesn't come naturally always. Um, and they won't necessarily be able to isolate that top joint to position their thumb behind. But you'll see in my little sketch there that it's sitting behind the joint. It's not the full donut that we see in the My First Piano Adventures. So the tips aren't together. The thumb is actually bracing the, the finger with its um, tip behind the first joint, making it stronger. So we play in this way with the right hand first and the left hand second and then hands together, right? Do this usually with finger two is the most comfortable, but whichever is the most comfortable for your student to start with. Then start to mix it up, asking them to use different fingers, different fingers with the thumb behind the tip. And you can mix it up, it can quite, get quite fun if you do, you know, finger three from the right hand and finger five from the left hand, you know. Make it fun, make it into a bit of a game and get them to get lots of practice working with this way. Then switch back to playing with the full hand in whatever the normal position of the piece was. But encourage them to keep that same feeling of the thumb being behind and supporting the finger. If they fall out of that shape, if their fingers start collapsing again, go back to the brace thumb or even back to the pencil if you feel like they're not using their arms. Write these steps at the top of their music to practice at home. So they should practice with the pencil, with their bionic hands and then play regularly. It doesn't have to be tons of steps, it doesn't have to be the full piece, but they need to get the f these two feelings into their body before they play their piece. This will take a lot of reiteration, especially with those students with those longer slender fingers. But if you keep repeating it, keep going through these steps, and like I say, they are fun, so that helps. Um, 
eventually over time this this uh, floppy fingertip will subside now so we're going on to the metronome ladder as i do this if you could just write in the chat if someone could just write in the chat just to make sure that's working i think i might be having some tech issues so I, I sounded a bit distracted there um trying to keep my eyes on two computers at once so if you could just write in the chat say a okay one of you that would be great if that's working um otherwise i'll keep going so the metronome ladder i'm sure all of you have used some form of this Seems to be back now. A okay. Okay, so we're fine. Um, if anyone else does have any problems with the chat, you might just need to refresh the page because that's what I did. So it seems to be fine now. Just double checking. Okay, wonderful. So the metronome ladder. Um, this is a way of curing allegro anxiety. Allegro anxiety are, is those students who are having trouble playing quickly put simply. They want to play very slowly. Normally they're students who are um, very cautious in nature, nervous maybe, or you may, the word perfectionist may come to mind. They may be students who just want to play all the correct notes at exactly the right time, which is extremely admirable. But the thing is they're never going to let go enough to just free up and play in the moment and play things quickly. It's not going to happen if they're that cautious about it. But if they are that cautious and nervous of playing quickly, they're going to need a lot of hand holding. So they need step by step instructions that they can apply in the future. They need a system to follow. And that's where the metronome ladder comes in. What you do for the metronome ladder is to find a comfortable starting tempo with a section or the whole piece, depending on the length, of course. Um, find a comfortable starting tempo. That could be 60, like is in the picture here. It could be 30, who knows? But find a tempo that they can play at with the metronome happily, comfortably, at least feasibly, okay? And then repeat that section, starting to move up three or five beats per minute at a time. The thing about this is the increases are so incremental that they barely feel them. And that's really the key here is you just nudge it up, nudge it up, nudge it up. So they're never feeling like they're really pushed. And as you nudge it up, eventually you'll hit a tempo where let's say you hit 75 and you go up to 80 and they can't quite do it. So you go back down to 75 and they're okay so you go up to 80 and they still can't quite do that okay that's your plateau tempo that's how you know where the plateau tempo is is it's hovering back and forth you can't seem to push it back past that point that's a plateau the other way you might plateau is if your student is getting annoyed if they're getting annoyed absolutely stop right there push them a little bit but then stop know their limits and write that down as a plateau tempo the next day they should start at 5 bpm faster than they started the previous day so you're just pushing it up a little bit at a time and maybe that next day they get up a little bit higher you'll see in the picture here it's gone up to 90. that might happen it might not they may only get up to 75 again no problem they will get there if they keep doing this during the week and they will gain so much confidence with being able to play quickly when they see that it's just a little bit at a time a little bit a little bit a little bit and they can use this system over and over to be able to push that tempo up now one more reminder that printable is in the handout at the end so stay tuned for that don't worry you don't have to go constructing that yourself that's printable is uh, in the handout at the end and um, you can send that home with your students. So it's a very simple system to follow. Just make sure you do it the first time in the lesson so they understand it. If they don't follow through at home, don't despair, try it again the next week. That's the, that's the overall motto. Don't expect kids to pick these things up instantly, but do keep at it and use that metronome ladder 
for the students with allegro anxiety. Dana says, look forward to the handout. Wonderful. And sounds very doable, precise, not vaguely trying to get faster. Exactly. That's the idea. Um, I know that's the way my mind works, so I really understand these students. I need a system like that. So that's that's the idea behind it. Julie asks, do you do your students have an assignment binder to keep these sheets for practice? Yes, I do all my assignments on assignment sheets, which I put in a folder. I used to use a notebook, but I switched to folders so that we could have stuff like this. I'd suggest if you don't have something like that already in place, uh, I'd suggest just paper clip it to the piece it's going to be practiced with. That's the best system, and I will do that for students who don't open their folders. So absolutely do that too if you're not into folders. Um, I think you can still use those printables. Okay, on to the next cure, the next practice method. This is called crash landing. That's an interesting one. This is a cure for what I call leap phobia. Leap phobia is when students have trouble moving around the keyboard. In particular, it's when they break their tempo um, or mess up the rhythm in order to be really certain of their next note. And they sort of pause over it and then they play it. The thing is they're never going to be able to move around with ease if this is the case. So they need to be able to leap and play the key in one foul swoop, right? Um, so how do we get them to do that? We need them to be more instinctive and less analytical. We need them to think less and do more, in other words. The crash landing is exactly what this is designed for. So there's a few steps to this. Start away from the piano and lift and flop your arms down by your side, both of you. Don't be shy, lift them high in the air, flop them down onto your legs. Do it really dramatically, don't push obviously, but do it really dramatically so that your hands might even slap against your legs. Wonderful, you know, you want it to be really obvious that you're just flapping your arms down. Once you feel like your student has got this feeling of just flopping, return to the piano, sit down again, and flop into the general area of the keys after the jump. Let me explain what I mean by this because I think it's a little bit confusing without uh, the video, but I'll try to explain myself. What I mean is, say, for example, we have a jump and it goes from treble G to high C, okay? They're going to play the treble G, lift their hand in the air, and flop generally around high C. So they're going to crash, literally, into the piano. They're going to play maybe seven keys at once. They're just crashing around that C. I hope that's clear. They just crash into the general area and you can demonstrate it and they will love it. Kids love this because you're letting them do something for once that they're never supposed to do. They're never supposed to just randomly smash their hands into the piano, but that's what we want them to do. Obviously, they're not pushing still, but they're flopping onto the piano in the general area. After they've got that feeling, that's when you switch to flopping onto the correct key after the leap. So in our example, we would have treble G and then we flop and land just on the high C. Don't play any more than that, just the two notes. Once they have that, with a feeling of freedom and you feel like they're playing it with ease, then go back a few bars before that treble G and a few bars after that high C and practice that section a few times so they can get that flopping feeling within the context of the piece. And then they can start from the beginning. The steps for this at home would be literally what you've done in the lesson, but minimize it. Make sure to practice them as they will be at home as well during the lesson. So stand away from the keys, flop your arms down, go to the piano, flop into the general area, and then flop just between the two keys, and then practice the full section. Just one after the other like that. In the lesson, the first time you're gonna do that lots of times to make sure they get it right, but then make sure to go through as it's going to be at home too, so they really understand what way they're supposed to practice. And you won't get much pushback on this, in my opinion, because it's fun, right? It's way more fun than just telling them to 
practice that leap or even just practice their piece it's way more fun to get to flop your arms down by your side they can show their parents all about it dana says my students will love that yes i hope so um my students certainly love exercises like that this they're really fun so write these steps on top of their music or use that printable at the end and send that home make sure they the parents understand it and um you shouldn't get too much pushback on that one Right, I know some of you will be wondering what Feeling Fuzzy is all about. It's an odd name. This is the cure for what I call accidental amnesia. Now, accidental amnesia is just my funny name. I am talking about key signatures as well. I just want to be clear about that. I'm talking about all sharps and flats, basically mostly black keys though, because we're talking about uh, beginners, intermediate students. Once they're playing things in D flat major, I would hope that they're not randomly missing accidentals or sharps or flats at that stage. But in the beginning, this can be really tough. And students can be missing them out a lot, especially with new key signatures. Often they're playing the wrong note and then fixing it. <laughs> fixing in inverted commas for a reason, because it's not really fixing, is it? If you play F and then play F sharp immediately after it, you didn't fix anything. You taught your hand to play F and then F sharp, not just F sharp. So that's not very helpful. What we want them to do is to play F sharp in the first place, immediately. And we want them to get a feel for how each key feels under their fingers, right? They need to do this kinesthetically. They need a kinesthetic sense of the keyboard rather than trying to analyze the score. That really doesn't help very much. Which is where feeling fuzzy comes in. So this is using uh, fuzzies or pom-poms. I've seen them called all sorts of things. You could also use cotton wool, anything you have around that is soft and will fit on the keys is absolutely fine. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, the more unusual, the better I think it could be really fun to use some random soft uh, surface, little bits of cloth, doesn't matter. So what you do is you first work together with your student to find the white keys that they shouldn't be playing in their piece, right? So if we take the example of a piece in D major, what you're going to do is put the pom-poms or the fuzzies or whatever you have on all the C's and all the F's that are within the range of your student's piece. So you don't need to do the full piano, you just do the range that's covered in your student's piece. Once you've done that together, ask them to start playing. With the caution that they shouldn't step on the fuzzies' heads. Fuzzies don't like that, okay? They don't want to be stepped on. So be careful, you don't want to step on the fuzzies' heads. Now, it often doesn't take much warning or much talking about this for them to get it. Once they feel those fuzzies and they're sitting under their fingers, they'll be aware that they're there quite quickly, um, at least from my experience. If they're not, all it takes is a little bit of encouragement not to step on those fuzzies' heads. And if they do play in through the fuzzy one of the times, you can make youching sounds, of course, which is good fun. Um, but also it's a more memorable feeling for them the next time rather than just remembering or half remembering that I played the wrong note the last time they remembered oh I stepped on the fuzzy's head so it really sticks and that's it they play through their piece they try not to step on the fuzzy's heads hopefully they don't even if they do no problem reiterate and practice it again the important thing with this cure now is that you give your student a lot of opportunities to find the correct keys to place them on for their home practice. Like we said, chances are the parents may not have studied a music instrument or the piano specifically. Even if they did, you know, how are they going to know what you're talking about with these fuzzies? So you need the student to do this themselves. And the best way to do that is interleaving it. So take the fuzzies back off the keys, move on to other stuff, come back and say, now where did we put those fuzzies? Let's practice finding those for your sonity now or whatever it is. Take them away again, practice other stuff again. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Okay, they need lots of practice finding the correct keys. Make sure they're absolutely certain. 
lend them the fuzzies to take home um, with instructions to bring them back the next week because you need them for their piece. They're very important. And they should practice with them at home. If they don't, no problem. Next week, help them find the keys again. That's probably what's causing it, even if they don't say that. So help them find the keys again. Really reiterate that they should do this at home and that this is how we find the keys, how are we going to remember this, et cetera, et cetera. As, um, as they get used to this, of course, they won't need the fuzzies. But you'll have that visual forever which is wonderful. You'll have that image of the little fuzzies and how they don't like being stepped on. And that's perfect because that gives you something to say that's not just, remember your F sharps, oh my gosh, don't forget to play the F sharp in this piece. Say, now there's gonna be a fuzzy sitting on that F key, isn't there? We better not step on his head. It's way more fun for you, for them, and it's way more memorable. So, um. I hope that will help you with that problem. I know it's an annoying one, and it's one where you can go hoarse just saying the the um, sharps and flats in a piece over and over and over, um, and this is way more fun. So I hope you'll have fun with it. I've already had some there's some comments there. It says really an idea from Neve. Thanks, Neve. I can help at least. I can think of at least five kiddos who have this problem. Okay, good. I'm glad it's a common one for you too, Jen. Um, excellent solution that is fun thank you uh, Julie such a great tactile exact exactly Julie tactile idea that's exactly the point because the more we say point at the page and say that's an F sharp it doesn't help that's what I've discovered it doesn't help what they need is a feel for it when I started to think about the way I play in a key signature it's a feeling I don't analyze whether there's a C and it should be sharp I just sharpen it under my fingers. That's what's happening. Okay, so I've shown you the five practice methods now. Hang on for that freebie. It's just going to be a minute. But what do you do if you need more practice strategies? What do you do with all the other problems, like the ones I've described today, to solve them without the headaches, with fun things like feeling fuzzy <laughs> that make it more enjoyable? Well, that's why I've created a little course, which is called the Piano Practice Physicians Clinic. So this course builds on what I've talked about in the Piano Practice Physicians Handbook, which you may know, or if you don't, you can pick it up on Amazon or anywhere like that. But the clinic goes more in depth into these cures, just like we've done today. Why have I talked about a piano practice clinic though? Why is it a clinic and a physician and why did I choose that analogy? Well, because it encourages you to be analytic and thoughtful about piano practice. It keeps you focused on the cure. So it keeps you thinking about how can I solve this problem? What's the solution? Not, oh my gosh, he just won't X, Y, Z, right? It's way more enjoyable to focus on the cure. It stops you and your student stressing and fretting about what they're doing wrong, what they're not doing, what they're not remembering to do. It takes the focus away from more practice and puts it on better practice. And that's what stops the stressing. And we all know that our students don't have a lot of time, right? They're in soccer practice or they're swimming or they're dancing or they're studying, you know, advanced algebra. I don't know but they're really busy, whatever they're doing. Almost all of them, they're way over scheduled. And we can ask them for more practice time all we want, but it might not come because there is just a lot on and they're probably fitting in what they can. So if we take the focus away from more practice and put it on better practice, it means that our students are going to have more fun during their practice time anyway. So you may just get more practice, but I really think the focus should be on making the best use, the best possible use of the time that they have. And when we shift our focus in this way, it also gives us more job, job satisfaction and fun for you as the teacher. I can't tell you how much more fun it is to spend a lesson putting pom-poms on keys and joking about stepping on fuzzy's heads 
I think you can imagine, than saying, play that F sharp over and over and over. And it's more satisfying for you as well because your students will make better progress. If they're practicing better, they will make better progress. I think we all know that. We don't want them to waste practice time. We want them to use it effectively. How is the course structured? It's split into six different parts. So I've organized it by the sort of type of practice problem that your students might have. The first part is chronic ailments. So these are the bad practice habits that are particularly sticky, persistent. They happen all the time. Next is fevers and chills. That's all these problems with tempo. Like today we dealt with allegro anxiety. That would belong in that section. These are all problems with playing too fast, which I'm sure you have a lot of as well, too slow, uneven tempo, that kind of thing. Heart palpitations are rhythm difficulties. I know a lot of teachers have trouble um, teaching rhythm or getting rhythms to really stick in students' minds and be um, consistent. So that's why that has a whole section devoted to it. Vision impairment, inattention to notations, marking symbols. So our um, accidental amnesia, that would fit in there, as would forgetting dynamics or articulations or that kind of thing. Ear infections are where I deal with musical insensitivities. So these are students who play way too loud or way too soft. Maybe they don't even recognize when they play wrong notes, or maybe they just don't play with enough expression. That's that area. And the final area is aches and pains. These are issues with technique. Like today we looked at floppy fingertip uh, predicament. That would fit in there. There are 32 different piano practice ailments, which I call them. Uh, in other words, piano practice problems, issues with piano practice um, that students might have, and they all fit into these six broad categories. The other thing about the structure of the course is that the videos are bite-sized, okay? So there are 98 videos in total. That sounds insane. I realize it does. And it if it just made you go, oh my god, I can't even, I wouldn't have time for that, I get it. But there's a reason there's so many of them. It's because I've made them really, really short. They're bite-sized, they're to the point. So that even if you only have a few minutes in between lessons, or, you know, Johnny's mum texts and he's going to be late, or you have time to grab a quick coffee and you want to find a solution to a particular student's problem, you can jump right in, jump right to that video and watch it in less than five minutes because each video is only one to three minutes long. So you could watch the explanation of what the problem is and one of the cures within three minutes sometimes. I know teachers are busy and I know you want to get to the stuff that's immediately relevant that you can take action on straight away. So that's why I've structured it like this. It might sound overwhelming since it's 98 videos, but they're all really short, sweet, to the point. I just jump in, give you the stuff that you can use to take action straight away. The other thing about this structure is that you can jump straight back to a video you watched. So say you do watch through the whole thing. Well, you can jump, you can think, oh, there was something about, I don't know, playing too quickly, right? And you can jump right back to that video and watch it again and get the cure within a few minutes rather than some lengthy video where I talk about lots of things and you have to try and find which minute I talked about that thing that you vaguely remember, right? You can jump right back to the video. So that's the idea behind that. Um, there is a workbook included in the course as well which will help you to take action. So there's place to take notes of what students you think have this problem, which cures you think might suit them, and any questions that you have about it. Which brings me to my next point. There is also a forum where you can ask questions. So I'm there, I'm absolutely delighted to help you. And if you have questions about the videos themselves, the practice issues I talk about, practice issues your students are having that I haven't covered. I'd love to hear those. Or just teaching in general. I'm happy to chat with you about anything and everything to do with piano practice and teaching in there. And that's a private community. No one else can see it. Your students can't see you talking about them. And you can get real solutions to things you're struggling with in your teaching. So 
the course is $97 regularly. That's less than a dollar a video. Like I said, there's 98 videos, so that's less than a dollar a video, and you get all that other stuff, the workbook, the community, and the access to other teachers so you can ask questions as well as from me too. Regular price is $97. There's a 20% discount available just for you guys for the next 48 hours only. Now, I really do mean that I don't like it when people say there's a discount for a certain length of time and they don't stick with it. So it will be exactly 48 hours. I'm gonna turn it off at 8 p.m. Uh, Sunday my time okay so that's exactly 48 hours and 13 minutes away from right now i will turn it off i i always mean what i say and it's a 20 percent discount so it's a big chunk i don't do that often if you enter the coupon code wonderful at the checkout you'll get that and you can get all this information about the course um see a tour of what it looks like inside i have no secrets there's a video um on the course page where you can see what it looks like on the inside, see the structure, see if it's right for you. And you can, of course, email me or write to me on Facebook, um, wherever is easiest for you to ask me questions about the course, because I don't want you to get it if it's not right for you. So feel free to ask me if you have any questions about the structure of it, whether it might help you with whatever problem you're dealing with, that kind of thing. Delighted to, to help you out. Um, but make sure to act fast to get that discount if you want that. And that freebie. Okay, so that's pianophysician.com slash wonderful. And you can start using those practice strategies. So those that freebie will give you the printables for the five practice strategies that we talked about today. If you have any questions, please speak up. I'll get back to the chat box right now. And I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer any questions that you guys might have. Delighted to do that. So let's just leave this up. So you have the course info there, and the coupon code, and the freebie address. So you can type that into your browser and go get that. Um, right, let's get back to this chat box for a second. Neve, totally agree. Kids are way too busy these days. It's tough to keep them excited on week on week because they have so much expected of them. Yes, totally. Sometimes they come into me and they're exhausted. They get hours of homework from like age seven here. So I completely sympathize with you, Neve. Um, Julie, I love your diagnosis titles for each specific issue. That's just one of my little... Um, I guess, uh, foibles. <laughs> I love alliteration and I love making titles for things. So the silly names, I just think they make everything more fun. I tend to give things funny little names like that. Um, Jen, parenting has changed. More free range, it's their responsibility to practice. It's their responsibility to practice. Any suggestions for parent input, I'd say she means. Right, yes. Parenting has changed, even since I was a kid, or definitely since, you know, definitely compared to the way my mom parented me, she didn't give me choices. And I see, I mean, she did give me choices with it to a degree, but you earned them, you know? Um, it's a big issue. One thing that piano teachers often say is <laughs> that it's like brushing their teeth. They shouldn't have a choice. Thing is, I think that goes much less well when you broach it later. So I think the key to getting the parents to see this as a habit that is their problem, that is issue, that is their responsibility and that they're part of this piano teaching, you know, stool with three legs, is that it happens straight away. So ideally, when you have new students come in, I would immediately have that conversation. Don't leave it till later. Don't be worried about scaring parents off. You need to have that conversation, not in a scary way, but you need to say to them, okay, this is how my studio runs. I expect this much practice or, you know, roughly it'll take this long per day. It should be five days a week. Whatever you say, whatever your expectations are, it could be 10 minutes, could be an hour. I, I don't think it matters. It depends what type of studio you run, of course, but you need to make it clear with parents from the start 
that it's their responsibility, especially with students, say, under 10. You know, it is the parents' job to reinforce that. It is their job. So I think the key to much of my success with this issue recently has been that I am clear from the start. At that initial interview, we talk about it in a very friendly, positive way, but we do talk about it. Um, and then I send a follow-up welcome email that says, this is how you can get the most out of lessons, blah de blah de blah right? And I keep checking in with them. Now, I'm not gonna say I don't have kids who slip through and parents do not get it. <laughs> and I do sympathize. If that is the case, I think you need to even more to use effective practice, practice strategies with your students because if the parents are not involved at all, the students needs to be even more intrinsically motivated to do it themselves, right? And the way that we gain intrinsic motivation is that we see progress from the work we put in them to see this by at the lesson saying pointing out what they're doing like oh you practice so much this week how did you practice oh that clearly helped with this this and this help them to see how it, how they're progressing and how it's helping um but the more effective their practice is the more they can gain that intrinsic motivation i really hope that helps I, i'm sorry if i rambled a bit there but that's a big issue Okay, from Becky, send wonderful to have short videos for right when you need them. Yeah, that's the ex idea. That was my thinking behind it. You know, I'm a teacher, <laughs> just like you. I have 35 students um, taking mostly 45 minutes lessons. You know, I've been asking to switch and doing all of these things that piano students do. I have a lot on too. So I thought about what I would want. That's what I would want. Jump in, get the cure for the problem that I have right now not some theoretical knowledge that might be useful in the future. Um, and on 5044, does the access expire or will it always be available? I'm assuming she's talking, she or he is talking about the wonderful bonus. Uh, that'll be available. I wouldn't worry about that, but you know, jump over and get it, download it. There's no reason not to save it now. Um, the coupon is 20%. Oh, maybe she's talking about the course, actually, now that I think about it. The course is um, a year. You can have it for a year for that price. There will be an option to extend it if you need extra time. So I wouldn't worry about it. I won't charge much for that at all. But um, it's a year initially, so you have plenty of time to look through and um, ask questions in the community and that sort of stuff but I will be offer offering an opportunity to extend that. Does this include the book or is it separate? It is separate. The book is available on Amazon, Kobo, Nook, all those sort of places. If you want the link to the book, um, just go to pianophysician.com. It's the homepage. So you'll see links there to everywhere that you can buy the book um, and hopefully that should help you out there. Or you can just search for it. If you search for piano practice at the moment, I think it turns up as result number three. So that's really cool. Um, Laura says, thank you. You're very welcome, Laura. Delighted to be of help. Julie, titles can help students remember the issue. Yes, they're catchier, right? It sticks way more if you have a title that the student can remember. Um, Oh, your turbo booster worksheets are helpful to give parents. Yes, that's what they're designed for. So you can give them out at the initial interview. I email them to them as well um, after the initial, after they've started lessons and you can always throw them back at them again. And uh, yeah, hopefully they follow through on it um, because you keep reiterating, well, you know, not overdoing it, but keep reiterating to a certain point how this is the way to make the most out of piano lessons. They might not realize, you know, they might not know. I'm just going to turn off this screen sharing now so I can see you all again. Yeah, they might not realize 
exactly what piano practice means if they haven't studied themselves or maybe didn't do very well themselves that may have been the reason so um yeah they need to understand that this is how they make mo the most out of their investment this is how piano practice works they might not get it so it may need explaining over and over but hopefully those sheets do help if anyone is looking for those or wondering what they are talking about their turbo booster um, worksheets. You can get those on colorforkeys.ie slash blog. Just go to the main blog and you'll see a link there in the sidebar and below the posts where you can download the turbo booster. Um, and yeah, hopefully that helps with that. Uh, there's stuff in there for parents, all about piano practice and different practice resources for kids as well. Now, very long comment from me, so I'm just going to read this. Do you work your lessons where if a student misses one unannounced that it cannot be made up? Okay, completely nothing to do with practice, but I'm happy to answer this too. Um, so, do you work your lessons where if a student misses one unannounced, it cannot be made up? I run my studio like this as I have too many students to make up if everyone were to miss unexpectedly. I find some parents do not agree with this system, but I am firm that it is fair for both ends as I am keeping the slot available and waiting for them. Let me know your thoughts on this. Neve, yes, no chance of makeups ever, ever, ever in my studio. Now it depends what we mean by makeups, so I will be clear. There's no such thing as what I would call a makeup, which is they miss it and then they expect to catch up on that. No, no chance, never, never gonna happen. That's not fair. That doesn't, how is that, how is that reasonable? No chance. I know teachers do this and good on you if you do, fair enough. You run your studio, I'll run mine, but I do not think that is fair to teachers, the expertise they have, the years they put into studying and their time. So no, no chance of that. Reschedules are a different thing. Um, in my policies, uh, students, parents, whatever, are welcome to text me, uh, email me, whatever, well in advance and let me know if they're going to be missing a lesson. And my policy is if I have another student cancellation, they can have that. Okay, so I don't alter my schedule ever. Uh, I'm quite tough, but I'm tough from the start. Um, and it also comes in the way that I talk about things, I think, in the vocabulary. This is one of the big changes, I think, for me. When I was starting out, when I was, because um, I started teaching when I was a teenager, I got pushed around all the time by parents. So that's why I'm quite strict on this. And I think the more strict you are, the more you get respected and they don't even mind. But if you give leeway and maybe are inconsistent about it or you say one thing and then another, um, or even sometimes you can give a makeup and sometimes you can't. I don't know. I don't think it works. I think they're just going to, you know, take a mile. And I don't think you can blame them. I think we expect too much them, you know, we put too much on them to be like, oh, why are they treating us like this? If you let them, that's what they learn to do. You know, you have to train your piano families to treat you the way you expect to be treated. As much as we'd like to think that people should just be nice, they don't know they're imposing. They don't know what they're doing and they don't really understand it unless you talk about it in the right way. So we talk about, you know, they're booking a slot. You're paying to hold 6.30 on a Monday. You're not paying for a lesson every single week. And it doesn't often come down to me literally saying that, but I will do it. I will look them in the eye and say, this is what you're paying for. I hope that was clear from the beginning. This is what you're paying for. You're holding that spot on a Monday. I can't give it to anyone else. I absolutely won't. If I have to miss it, guaranteed, absolutely. I'll give them a, a, a refund or a reschedule or whatever it is they want. But otherwise, no, can't guarantee reschedules. Julie, makes me wonder if they expect the dance or gymnastic. Yeah, I think it's the group versus the individual. They see it as like an appointment, as like, okay, well, 
you're just sitting there or you have free time, but it doesn't work like that. We know it doesn't, but I think that's where we run into real issues with this and that's where these things happen and parents can be a bit uppity about it. It's because it's one-on-one, -on -one, so they see it as them buying a lesson with you every week rather than they see it as buying a class, which is a group situation. And everyone understands that like, you can't make up a gymnastics class because there's a bunch of other kids there and it's still going to happen. You just missed it. It happened. You missed it. You know? Uh, Julie, what if we expect them to make a practice days? <laughs> I like it, Julie. Um, yeah. I don't think that would go well, saying that to them. But uh, yeah, give it a go. I love it. Great fun. Um, I did have one more question that I... Sorry, Kim says, I like that idea. Make up missed practice days. And Neve says, thank you. I totally agree and love how you worded it. You're very welcome, Neve. I hope I was helpful. Um, it's something I guess I made big mistakes on in the past. So yeah, it's something I think I know what I'm doing with now, but I didn't always. And I still struggle with it, still struggle with following through, although I do it every time it's still really tough for me. And I know it is for a lot of teachers because we tend to be quite nice people and maybe even people pleasers um, and maybe quite non-confrontational, I guess is the word. And I'm certainly like that. Um, you know, if a parent does get angry at me, which happens occasionally, especially if they're in a stressful situation, you know, one parent, their car broke down on the way and they were asking me to make up the lesson and I said, no, because I wouldn't do that if your kid was sick. I wouldn't do, I, I don't do it for any reason because if I start doing it for one reason, then they could lie and say they have that reason when they have another reason and it all ends up a mess. So I don't do it for any reason. And I did have a situation a few months ago, just shows how much it affects me because I'm still think I'm still telling you about it now, right? But she, her, her car broke down. Yes, terrible, I'm so sorry. But that doesn't mean I magically have free time. Sorry. Um, and I didn't say it like that. I was very nice, of course. But she got super angry. And, well, just very short, I guess. And she hung up on me in the middle of a conversation, which made me even less want to do anything about it. If, if she was nice, I actually might have done something for that particular situation. But with the way she was, no chance. The more you're like that with me now, I guess, the more I'm, I'm not going to give any leeway because I see that as a warning sign that you're going to take more and more and more and more and more if you're like that, if you're that demanding. So no chance, not getting anything. And um, she's still in my studio, you know, we moved on, but it really, I think a lot of teachers are this way actually, is it, it you know, really affects us. And it's very hard to hold your ground in that situation when somebody is being irate and when they're clearly displeased and we know there are clients and stuff, but in the long run, it's better to stick to your policies, you know? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling, but I did have a question that was from a Facebook group um, member whose name was Dana. So I wonder if that was the Dana that was on, but anyway, I'll answer it. It might be a different Dana. Um, even if it is, she's here then. So that's wonderful. Uh, she had a question about how it's difficult to encourage beginning piano students to practice using effective strategies. Um, and I thought it was an interesting question because she was talking about how uh, method book pieces are so short, right? So it's very simple in the beginning for them to play from start to finish and they will make good progress. And I think that's true. And I often see that as a problem that there is this transition then. So she was asking about practice strategies for beginner piano students to get them in the habit of practicing effectively, even when they have a piece, you know, that's four bars, eight bars long. Um, and I, yeah, I have the, I encourage them to follow specific steps for this. So I ask them to 
sing their piece and count their piece and name all the notes, you know, so they have specific steps, even if they don't need to practice in sections, I still think it's useful that for them to have these separate steps to follow. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting question. And I think the best resource to send Dana to would be the practice step sticker. So I am going to send her to that. Um, and if any of you are looking for those, those are at colorfulkeys.ie. And if you just put practice steps or practice stickers or whatever in the search bar, they should pop up there. Let me know if you can't find them. Um, and I'll pop the link to those on this post in Vibrant Music Studio Teachers. So if you're not in the group, please join. I'd be delighted to have you. Um, and hopefully that will help with that. But yes, I think using steps, even with the method books, is good as just as training for practice does not look like playing from the start to the end, uh, which, by the way, I call start again syndrome. And it is one of the most common practice issues, and it is in the clinic and in the handbook. So if you want solutions to that, um, that's where you'll find them. But uh, yes, I do think it stems from this method book thing and that they, there's this transition period where they suddenly it's not working anymore to play from the start to the end, just like that. Um, extra comments here. Jen, all their soccer gymnastics practices happen at the activity. Piano has to be done almost entirely at home. It's true. That's what I said about the 99% of their week, right? So we get a little chunk of their week. You know, if someone, if, if a kid is doing swimming, at least here, they do swimming like six days a week with their instructor, right? So they're trained all the time. That is swimming practice. And they do go to soccer practice, you know? where it really is the practice. It's several times a week and it is where they do their training and it's where they learn. But piano is where we tell them what to practice and then they have to do it at home. So it's a completely different setup. But you know, we're not gonna get them to pay us every day for individual lessons. If we can, that would be awesome. I know occasionally that happens, but it's not common. Um, we get 30 to 45 minutes a week and there's no progress to that piano homework every day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's so true, you know. That's why I'm, I talk about with other teachers and with my students practice so much. That's what I spend a lot of my time doing. We need to train them during that 1% to use the other 99% of the time effectively. Because otherwise they won't make progress, you know? Um, Julie, do you have parents sit in on, during lessons to observe the practice strategies to help the child at home? A few of my parents do sit in on lessons. Now, I will say it's not actually that common. Um, I welcome them too, and often they do in the beginning. And then we get to a stage where it's actually more effective for them not to be there, at least in my opinion. Um, and it used to be in the beginning, I used to be really uncomfortable with parents being there just because I found it awkward, but uh, I don't anymore. I welcome them to sit there and often they do, especially in the beginning stages. But as we progress, I find that the relationship doesn't develop in the same way if the parents are there some kids will be a bit, I was gonna say showy offy. I don't really mean that. I mean, they wanna show their parents how good they are. So they kind of get a bit performancey for the whole lesson. And that's not very good because they need to be able to work through the problems. So it depends what kind of parents, you know, parent kid relationship it is, but often that happens or they'll just get distracted. Like some kids I've had, their parents in the lesson and they literally cannot stop coming up with things they meant to say to their mom or dad especially if they didn't see them all day you know most parents here work so if they're seeing them for the first time that day you know if it's after work or something it's oh you know mom i i got an a on my spelling test today or whatever they just have lots of nonsense to say to their parents and that's great and all but they interrupt the lesson to do it um so 
yes, sometimes in the beginning, um, but after that, not so much. Uh, with young students, I think it's very useful, but again, they can get distracted. So I think there's a balance to be struck there. What I suggest doing is inviting the parent in for the last five minutes or so, and asking your student to explain to the parent how they're going to practice at home so that you can both sort of observe the situation. I think that's the best of both worlds, where you're saying, what did we talk about today? Explain it to mom, and you're all there and all witnessing it, and your student is also reinforcing how they're going to do it because they're explaining it to someone else. The other solution, if the parents can't be there, is uh, to ask them to go through the practice folder, notebook, whatever, whatever notes they get, um, website, wherever they are, at home, the day of the lesson, as soon after the lesson as possible, and ask the parent to ask the student about it. So explain to me how this is going to work, and how's that, and how does, what do you do there, and what did teacher say to you about X, etc., like that. Um, I do think those solutions, at least for my studio, have been a better balance because yeah the parents sitting in on the full lesson it works great for some families and I have a few who it's just wonderful like one in particular I'm thinking of um been with me for three years or so and you know the mum is the perfect piano parent to have in the lesson and the student is perfect with her mum so it just works great it means her mum can help her to remember stuff at home and it also means, you know, her mum is there to applaud when she does something great. But I've also had parents who are overly critical or who want to applaud every single little thing and they're interrupting because they're so full of praise, which is awesome. It's great and it should be used at home, but it does interrupt the lesson. Hope that helps, uh, Julie. Jen Morgan, that's a brilliant idea. Charge for piano practice time and have them come more often just for practice. Well, you know. Uh, do you know Irina Gorin? Irina or uh, yeah, Irina, isn't it pronounced? Yeah, um, Gorin. Tales of a Musical Journey that is her method book. She um, has students come at least twice in the beginning stages. If we all had that luxury, she insists on it, and I get it. She runs a very serious, I guess you could call it, classical studio. Um, her students beautifully I mean have you seen them on YouTube they're gorgeous but I don't run that type of studio um, I run a friendly welcoming studio with you know a broad range of students and I'm also not in a particularly affluent area of the city so no chance of that happening but I do think it's wonderful if it can and you know you can see the results in her students uh, not just from that from her beautiful teaching I mean she's an amazing teacher but I do think it helps in the beginning to have several lessons a week. Um, I'm sure it's what makes a huge amount of that difference, as well as her being a fabulous teacher. Also, children can be weaker with parents there, two or three. Yes! They. Sorry, I'll finish reading that for people who uh, can't. Um, commenter says also, children can be weaker with parents there, two authorities in the room can be hard. I interrupted myself because I think that's so true. Students will like look to their parents. I mean, even without the authority thing, students will like look to their parents so much that they're not even proactively trying to come up with the answers themselves because they're so used to their parent being their helping hand that they're barely even, you know, and they that extra responsibility is missing for their own learning. Um, and Julie agreed about having parents present overall. A good idea for having students explain to their parents how they have to practice. Yeah, I think that's a great strategy to use. If you can implement it from the very start, you'll have the best success. But absolutely bring it in later as well. Wonderful. Um, and reminding parents to check assignments. Yeah, check the assignments, but also ask the student to explain what to happen with the assignments because otherwise you'll get the start again syndrome and <laughs> that's not good um okay so i will hang on for a few more minutes 
in case anyone has any more questions. But otherwise, we're going to get finished up here. It is quarter past eight on a Friday uh, here in Dublin. And uh, yeah, I'm finished teaching for the day. And I'm going to go make dinner soon. So uh, it's been wonderful chatting to all of you. Really enjoyed it. I hope you've all got a lot out of the methods and that you'll take a look at the course because it is it's really fun it's i've made it as useful as i know how to and i'm always open to more suggestions so if you get in and something isn't the way you think it should be i'll change it so there's that too and there's a community so you can get all your questions answered in there and i think it's a really useful place to be um so any more questions, please leave them in the chat. I'm gonna refresh this again. Um, I don't know if you can see, well, you can kind of see some of my messy office space. I'm just noticing how, quite how messy it looks, but that, um, that's how it goes, eh? Well, this part isn't messy, right? These are all my student builders. That's how I keep all my students organized. But yeah, behind me there, it's pretty messy. And the blinding light, which you can see, that's because there's a window there. Couldn't help it with the angle. Uh, Jen says, thank you so much. I'm, you're so welcome. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Julie, one student who's 13, has been with me four years, always looks to her dad for permission or what she should play next. Yes. Yeah, it can be tricky. You know, I have a student actually uh, looks organized to me. Does it, Becky? Yeah, it's just all this mess. But anyway, yeah, it's pretty organized. It never gets more organized than this. I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm not saying it's unusual. Um, uh, yeah, I had a student who her dad taught her the mnemonics. And I don't teach mnemonics. I teach landmark notes, right? Fair enough, not a big deal. But she clearly thinks the world of her dad, even more than a normal kid. And that's great because her dad's lovely and she's lovely. But she was so stuck to these mnemonics because he had said them. And he only said them because that's the way he learned and he was just trying to help her with her homework. It just it just came out, you know, he didn't even mean to teach them to her. And she was so stuck to them. Um, which makes me think of your student. You know, looking, it can be just that they admire them so much that they want or it could be a strict thing. I don't know what yours is, but um, yeah, it looks to her dad for permission of what she should play next, even, yeah, if I ask her what she'd like to do. Yeah, so that's where, because a lot of kids are getting too many choices, but they do gradually have to build up their ability to choose stuff. It is a gradual thing. I can't remember what I was reading about that. Uh, something to do with childhood psychology, but yeah, they need to gradually build up. So in the beginning, it's just, um, I need to do this. Uh, in the beginning, it's just about choosing between simple things and they need to build up their ability to choose stuff. It sounds kind of funny, but they do. And if they don't get opportunities to ever choose, then yeah, they can end up looking to their parents for every little choice. And that's not good either. I think you need to build it up. Julie, thank you. It's been great. Enjoy your trip to Idaho when you're here. Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, I'm going to be heading over to Chicago for NCKP. And then me and my friend are traveling through Idaho. So um, and up to Portland. It's a big trip. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Um, so thank you for joining. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for all your comments, Julie. It's been fantastic having you. Um, do you ever find whilst working on a problematic area that the student can, just cannot retain attention? Yes. What sorts of things do <laughs> you do in those situations? How do you regain, regain attention and such? Thanks so much for loving the chat. Um, right. In attention. How old is the student is my first question. But even if they're old, yes, I get it. They Repeating it several times it can be really 
counterproductive if they're not going to pay proper attention and really focus on what they're doing because otherwise they're just practicing mistakes and that's worse than not practicing sorry to say it but it is it's worse than not practicing at all they might as well just stop so uh depending on their age the only thing the reason i bring up the age is depending on their age would change uh how silly i would be <laughs> so if they are a little kiddo, what we would do is get up between the repetitions and wiggle. Just jump up and down, do jumping jacks, wiggle it out. I have these little cards. They're not here. They're in my studio, but um, which are called Silliness Siestas. I made these for uh, the Upbeat Piano Teacher webinars, which, by the way, are still open. You should check those out if you haven't seen them. Um, it was for a preschooler webinar that they did. Um, upbeatpianoteachers.com and uh, I made those and they just give them little brain breaks so we use those as incentives to repeat something if it needs repeating so you know repeat it once and then we'll get up and do the brain break other ways to keep it interesting there's tons of different things that I use that are in the clinic and in the handbook so things like sixes and sevens so different ways of mixing it up um, and switching back and forth so that they stay alert. All I'm trying to do all the time is keep them in the moment, focused on that thing. That's a lot of what I do with these practice strategies. Another resource that might help you with that is my playful practice cards. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm just recommending you buy stuff. I, I really am. And it's just hard to give specific advice because what you need to do is vary it a lot, right? So I can't give you tons and tons of ideas because you have to write them all down really fast so what i recommend you do is take a look at those resources um playful practice cards are different prompts that i use that give you them something different to do with it every single time so funny little things like switch your hands and all this kind of stuff we were using those at a performance class that I did last week and it was super fun. It made such a difference and it made them think so much more like they had to say so present to get the tasks right. And that's what those cards are all about. Um, I hope that helps. But even if you can't get any of those resources, totally cool. But just um, try and come up with different ways for them to do it every single time. That's what I'm saying. That's the key. You have to come up with something to vary it and you have to take little breaks and jump up and down, especially if they're active little ones. Hope that helps. Um, Sarah, thanks for the great practice strategies. Just ordered your book and can't wait to implement these new strategies. Sarah Pepper. Oh, I do know that name. Uh, now that it's a full, but I still don't know if it's Sarah or Sarah. Most people are actually Sarah in the US. Um, here, without the H would be Sarah, but that's not the case over there, I don't think. Anyway, so Sarah Pepper, uh, great practice strategies, just ordered your book and can't wait to implement the new strategies. So I really hope you enjoyed the book. Um, do shoot me a message on Facebook, write, me in, write to me in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers or um, email me, always open to getting emails. If you have any questions while you're going through the book or comments, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I've really enjoyed the responses I've been getting from teachers about the book. It's been overwhelmingly positive and really wonderful. There's some lovely reviews on Amazon and I've also been getting messages on Twitter and Facebook with people saying how much they're enjoying it. So, which is, you know, it's just wonderful. I poured a lot of hours into it to make it uh, not just practical and good uh, you know for teachers to use and full of good information but readable <laughs> i put a lot of effort into making it really readable and hopefully it has a little bit of a sense of humor so that it's not just this dry practice manual i really tried to avoid that and i hope that comes across it does seem to from teachers i've talked to so really hope you enjoy it sarah um Okay, I'll give it a few more minutes. I know I said that last time, but I really enjoy chatting with you all. So I will give it a few more minutes just in case anyone has any extra questions that they want to ask. It's always so fun doing these live chats and seeing people from all over. You know, it's great fun. Um, I love that we can do this. I love the internet. <laughs> I 
it's great fun that we get to connect in this way. Uh, Neve, Selena Siestas. Yeah, I keep them in a painted, like polished painted coconut. I wish I had it here because it's funny. Um, that a friend brought back from the Philippines. It's like got a face on it. And I was using it today, actually. I had a four year old in. He has so much trouble focusing. Like you get him to focus for more than 30 seconds, and this is what he does. <sighs> um, you know, I teach students as young as three. So I'm used to dealing with that. And we do have a lot of silliness siestas. Today, some of his included playing air violin with an orchestra track. Um, we've also done uh, jumping up and down, or uh, what were we doing the other day? Oh, we were doing some, I threw some kid yoga moves in there as well. So there's like a forward fold, because, you know, blood go to the head, fantastic, get the focus back, or different, different things like that, and little musical activities, you know, tapping beats and stuff. Um, another thing to do, if you need a break, and you don't mind singing, which you shouldn't, sing as much as possible. I'm a terrible singer and I do it all the time in my lessons, so just go for it. Get up and march and sing. That is the best break. Just march around your coffee table or whatever you have, you know? So much fun. Um, there's a song called Sally Go Round the Sun, which is in a Kadai book as, uh, from NICOS, the National Youth Choir of Scotland, NICOS. Um, they have a book called Singing Games and Rhymes, and there's a song in that called Sally Goes Around the Sun. You should look it up on YouTube and use it for your next silliness siesta, even if you don't have the cards. Um, and you march around the coffee table in time to the music, and then at the end of it, it says, boom, and you turn around. It's so much fun. It's great. Um, but anything like that, it will actually save you time. I promise. It might seem like you're wasting less than time. You're not. First of all, it's musical. But... Second of all, it'll save you time in the long run because there's less time of your little preschooler going, <sighs> or whatever it is. Maybe they don't sigh. Maybe yours aren't as rude as mine is. Uh, he doesn't mean to be rude. I just mean it appears that way, but he's only four. He doesn't know. Um, yeah, you will save time if you take those little silliness siestas. Um, and do check up at the Upbeat Piano Teacher resources if you're teaching preschoolers or teens or groups. They have an older one that's about groups that I'm not in, but it, fantastic as well, I'm sure. Um, and they're open until May 10th. 10th. That's so soon. It's also my best friend's birthday, so they're closing very soon. Uh, and they don't open them that often, so that's a really good opportunity to jump in there if you haven't already. Uh, I'm amazed at all the help available nowadays. I used to teach in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was very little quick ways to get help. Glad to be starting again. Yeah, I so agree with you. The thing is, I know I look young. I am young. I started teaching when I was 15, though, so I do have quite a few years of experience. Um, and I, I won't say I was miserable. I enjoyed teaching fine, and I pretty much taught the way I was taught myself. And it was all fine. And my students sort of made progress and it was grand, right? Then I took a couple of years off. And when I got back into it, I don't know what it was I was Googling, but I stumbled across a couple of blogs. This is about like six, seven years ago. I stumbled across a couple of blogs and they had really interesting ideas. And one thing led to another and another and another. And then I started my own blog. And, you know, the rest is history, I guess. But it's just such a different world to when I started teaching and just going on what my teacher said or what was available in method books or whatever. Um, it's so different and it's so much more fun. Like, I'm addicted to it. I love teaching now. And I liked it before, but I didn't love it. And I think this is what made the difference. It's having this global community where we can all share ideas and no one's being like secretive, you know, conservatoire style, hiding it away. I'm sure people still are. I just mean the people I talk to aren't. We're all about sharing ideas and we don't care that someone might be our competitor. They're not our competitor. We're all collaborators in creating the next musical generation. I'm getting a bit high fluid now, but you get what I mean. It's about sharing. And I love that about it, you know? We're all making teaching better and making more musicians for the future. And we all know 
that musicians are nicer people, right? So we're making a nicer next generation, which I love. It's wonderful. Um, so I'm glad you find it the same. It's very different to it was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, sorry for that rant, but it's true. It's so much more fun now. Rant needed water after all of that. Okay. It's half eight now. Whoopsie daisies. Right. Didn't mean to go on this long. I hope you found it helpful though. Um, I am going to sign off now uh, and get on with my evening. But I really hope you enjoyed the workshop. It's been a ton of fun chatting to all of you. Um, and like I've said already, make sure you join the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers community on Facebook. If you want to check out the course, it's pianophysician.com slash course. Your coupon code is wonderful. And if you want the freebies, go to pianophysician.com slash wonderful. So it's all wonderful. Um, if you forget either of those, miss them, want to ask me more questions, catch me on Facebook, colorfulkeys.ie. That's colorful with the two U's because I'm from Ireland. So it's the extra U in there. Colorfulkeys.ie for Ireland. Um, and colorfulkeys, again, with the extra U on Facebook or just, you know, search for me and find me everywhere. I'm all around. Um, but it's been so much fun chatting with you. And uh, I'm going to sign off now. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Most of you are behind me time zone wise. So I can promise you it's going to be fantastic. Um, and yeah, I'll let you get on with your day. Talk to you all soon. Bye. <laughs>